Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the BAUS e-poster session number nine on prostate cancer diagnosis. My name is Caroline Moore. I'm Professor of Urology at University College London and was really looking forward to meeting my colleague, Professor Nicolas Mote from France at, in Birmingham. Of course, we're now doing this remotely. So thank you very much, Nicolas, for joining us um, in the evening in your time when I know that as many of us are, you're very busy with COVID work and prioritizing patients at the moment. So just as a note for those of you who have already seen some of the posters that have been uploaded, we won't be doing them in the order of the abstract book, but we've grouped them into various uh, groups that really map the patient journey through an initial diagnosis through to some treatment. So the first poster that we're looking at is looking at a community screening study. And this is from the group of urologists in Reading. And the fellow presenting the poster is Tarek Al Hamori. So this is an interesting event where the Lions Club, which is a, a men's uh, club in England, that it does a lot of community activity in terms of health and other charitable causes and they organized a PSA screening day where over 2,000 men attended for a PSA screening event. It then goes through and details how they stratified these men and they looked at an age-specific PSA cutoff and using that they had 91% of men had a normal age-specific PSA 3.7% of men had an abnormal PSA, and that was 128 men, of which 111 were seen in their prostate clinic, and 40 men were diagnosed with cancer. They've done some really interesting calculations and calculated that the screening cost £103 per person, which was cheaper than breast screening, and they proposed that it's actually more effective than breast screening. I think it's interesting to see this without knowing how men were selected, what sort of advertising they did. Screening programmes usually go through a GP process in the UK. I don't know how it works in France, whether you have any organised screening events run by various groups or? No, not at all. We're, we're, well, the, the official position of France is against systematic screening. It's mainly for early diagnosis, but it's only based on GPs and we're asking GPs to solve all the questions before referring and starting with a PSA, which is a complete nonsense in reality. Yeah. Yeah, and we have a similar position in the UK. So there's no screening program. Men can ask their GP for a PSA test if they want one. And yeah, the GP is supposed to, in a seven minute consultation, go through the pros and cons of BSA, yeah. which as urologists, we spend whole conferences debating. So in essence, I think this is a, a nice bit of work, but it would be really good to know the context of how they invited these men and also to know some of the demographics of the men. We know that when we put out some sort of call for prostate assessment, we often get men in a higher economic strata and those who are white coming forward more commonly than other groups. And that isn't always where the highest risk of prostate cancer lies. Yeah. Um, but uh, interesting work and it'd be interesting to see what they what they follow that up with. Yeah, that's, that, that's nice. What, what worries me a little bit, and that, that might be repeated throughout various postures that, okay, the out of the 2000, 200 men, only 32 had an ESOP equal or above two. And we don't know if how many of those with ESOP equal or above two had just one single course with one millimeter biopsy positive or the 12 course positive, which is not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. How the MRI, if it was a local, if there was a spot to no spot. Mm -hmm. And it just, just saying this to me is not enough to say, well, it's worth, it's worth um, screening. Mm -hmm. It's an argument to say that I'm not aware of single paper showing now that systematic screening improves anything outside, uh, outside uh, specific survival despite a lot of major issues 
and outside increasing the cost and increasing the number of non-significant lists. So, That's right. And I, I don't think they reported the insignificant cancers that uh, were diagnosed, which obviously hugely adds to the cost of any screening program because you then are sure. obliged to follow them up. So yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, I agree. But I think what it does indicate is that men are often keen to have this looked at. I mean, also when you look at the age range, 39 to 89 years, that's quite a large range and typically screening studies would be the sort of 50 to 70 age range. So again, interesting, but it's unlikely to, um, oops, uh, to allow a screening program to go ahead, but it is some interesting data on yeah. really um, willingness to be screened in certain groups. Agree. If I can make a very last comment on that, um, 89 years old man, why not? But then the key question is, what is life expectancy of this man? And uh, with a, a, an age limit, with absolutely nothing regarding comorbidities and individual life expectancy is, for me, at least a complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. But I would say that exactly the EAU position. There's no, there shouldn't be an age limit, but a life expectancy limit, which is not exactly the same. There we go. So our second poster in this set is poster number three. And this is looking at the clinical utility and cost modeling of PHI to refine the pathway of who gets an MRI scan. So PHI first reported um, by Stacey Loeb and Bill Catalona, and it's really a mathematical model using total PSA, free PSA and pro PSA. And this group, um, have looked at it to see whether we can reduce the number of MRI scans that are done. They've concluded that it would cost less to do a PHI test before selecting men for a biopsy, but I think that it is something of a close run thing here um because they quote a 20 percent reduction in costs using phi and that's by doing 20 percent less biopsies but another way to do 20 percent less biopsies is to not biopsy every positive mri and they do say that their initial comparison was simply biopsying everybody and uh, nicola do you have any more comments on that yeah I fully agree with that i would i would also argue that uh, if you go phi and you only consider an mri in the phi positive uh, then you completely change the reference group and the NPV might be completely different because you super select patients at risk. Mm -hmm. And I'm not aware of any value of negative predictive value of MRI in a very large cohort when you super select mm -hmm. a, a, a cohort of, patients, of men at potential risk. So the negative predictive value in that situation might be changed. And second, I'm not fully convinced by their conclusion because if you purely a cost, it depends how costly is an MRI and the costly is a phi. Mm -hmm. But if you check the missing, uh, the missing uh, Gleason grade group two and above, there's 1% difference. What is 1% when you're dealing with one 554 men? It's almost nothing. So I would say the two pathways are correct. Mm -hmm. If you want to, to lower the cost, lower the cost of phi or the MRI or both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's also fair to say that there are fires certainly not available in, in all hospitals, wouldn't be available in our hospital. We can just get a total PSA and that's it. It's nothing more, more fancy than that. So, But uh, it's, it's, it's attractive to have as tools to select even more patients before going for, for things that are not related to uh, interpretation or eye interpretation or physician interpretation. That's also of interest. And it's, it seems to be very prospective, which is not that frequent in these <laughs> kind of things. Yes, that's true. I think that is, uh, I think the authors are to be congratulated on that. And that's from the um, academic urology group in Cambridge, who, uh, as we know, have a very good MRI program. So if we move on to the next poster, So this poster is from the Imperial Prostate Group, uh, led by Hashim Ahmed, 
and this is looking at something called the rapid pathway and this is a pathway set up in response to our UK preoccupation with timelines from referral to diagnosis. It incorporates the use of an MRI prior to any biopsy and for the rapid pathway they also were offered a local anaesthetic transperineal biopsy as a way to, to speed things up here. So uh, they've looked at a large group of men across a number of different hospitals that were taking part in the rapid pathway throughout the RM partners uh, group and they looked at a cohort of 280, 2,869 men and looked at those who were discharged because they had an MRI score of 1 or 2 and a PSA density of 0 0.12 or less and this was um, about half of the cohort. They then looked at those men who were re-referred and saw whether or not they had additional cancers detected out of 1,196 men who were re-referred, four were diagnosed with uh, Gleason 3 plus 4 or I sub 2 disease, and 33 were re-referred without uh, any diagnosis of cancer. So overall of those who were discharged, 0.3% were later shown to have cancer. So really saying that it is safe to discharge these men with a negative MRI scan. The rapid pathway is relatively new. I think it started in 2017. And so there will be further follow-up to be done, but I think at three year follow-up, this is a really acceptable re-referral and positive biopsy rate. Yeah, I, I think that's very attractive. I have a question. What, what was the, the reason for re-referral? Mm -hmm. Just a PSA rise or what was that? Yeah, and I don't, they haven't sort of, um, specified that they have said that they had given an individualized PSA for re-referral and that's what we do in our practice as well so you can re-refer if the you know if the PSA is this um, but they haven't said whether people had other reasons for re-referral so I presume most of it was PSA but there may have been other reasons. And the second thing that is for me is missing once again the the results are very attractive. There are two other things that I want to comment on the first one is what about the center selection regarding MRI quality? Are they super selected or is there the average MRI level of radiologists? I think it's fair to say that um, centers that were in the rapid pathway had had their MRIs uh, pretty finely tuned. So this was a big initiative um, across a whole cancer group, five different hospitals in there. And I think it's, fair to say that wouldn't be an average MRI results across the UK but would be a high standard of MRI for these centres. So that's at least if we want to, to, to transfer that to other countries like mine that mm -hmm. might be a major limiting factor. Mm -hmm. The last comment I was surprised not to see anything regarding the 210 patients that had a urology follow-up. They never got any further MRI, any further biopsy, any, what happens to them? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point actually. And it doesn't say where, what the criteria were for urology follow-up versus not. That might've been different hospitals practicing differently, different urologists practicing differently, or it may be that they thought those were the highest risk men and they kept them in, but yeah, very good point. But at, at two years, it seems to be very attractive. That's, that's pretty true. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and in fact, this, we're now going to move on to poster nine, which is from the same imperial prostate group. And Martin Connor is the lead author of this one. So this is looking at those men who did go on to have a biopsy and asking the question whether we need to add in non-targeted biopsies to our targeted biopsies, something which is hotly debated in many places. Out of the initial group of 2,350, they had 840 men, 848 men who had both targeted and non-targeted biopsies. And they've observed that they didn't find any four plus three in the non-targeted biopsies. And they found different rates of clinically significant cancer at the uh, I sub 2 or Gleason 3 plus 4 level, depending on whether there was significant cancer in the target or not. So 
So interestingly, where men had clinically significant cancer in their target, nearly 18% had clinically significant cancer in non-targeted biopsies. I don't think they've given much information about whether those were close to the target or in another place. Um, they raise questions about whether we should be adding in non-targeted samples to help with our treatment decisions. Well, so now, again, it's attractive, but I would be very cautious to use these, these results to say, well, omitting, non omitting systematic biopsy seems to be correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I refer to the EA guidelines, we clearly stated, uh, still state that on top of targeted, you should use systematic biopsy. That's mainly based on transrectal. And I think transferenal is a new standard to the degree, but we, we should be a little bit careful of that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, again, the trials are very, the results are very interesting. Don't believe they are completely really to be to become standard of care. I don't know how it is in you in UK outside some special centers. Yeah, so I think the majority of people would do systematic as well as their targeted in some form or other. And in fact, although the sort of take home message from the center of the poster is strong about it's very rare to find clinically significant cancer only in the non targeted biopsies. I think they're actually putting forward the point that if you're going to find clinically significant cancer nearly 20% of the time outside of your target, that you should be doing those. And that it's not just about getting the target right, it's about helping patients make decisions and in particular about whether they would have whole gland treatment in terms of a RALP and nerve spare or not, whether they might have focal therapy, whether they might have active surveillance. And certainly in my practice, I will target the lesion of course but I always do sample at least the other peripheral zone I, 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 how do you how would you approach biopsies in your own center yeah we do exactly the same we're just switching from transrectal to transferial mm -hmm. we wanted to switch with the approach and the and do this under local anesthesia and not under general anesthesia which was the most open procedure with the transfer renewal in France. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, we still believe that a systematic on top of targeted are needed. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not convinced by focal therapy, but that's not the purpose of the poster <laughs> and not the purpose of the discussion. True. For our standard of care. Let's let me finish. Our standard of care. Fair enough. <laughs> and although I will just make the comment that in uh, when we had some changes to the diagnostic pathway due to COVID. We did prioritize sort of targeted biopsies, local anesthetic only, but I think many centers actually did continue with their usual approach. So, yeah. Okay, and we have a similar poster now or on, on a similar question from um, our Welsh contributors here. I will just bring that poster up. Uh, again, looking at that question, should we add in um, systematic biopsies to fusion targeted? And this is from the uh, University Health Board in Wales. Interestingly, they looked at previously biopsied men, whereas the rapid pathway looks at newly referred men. Um, the, another difference is that they used a biparametric 1.5 Tesla, so arguably some differences in uh, MRI quality there and uh, their conclusion was that we should also be uh, doing systematic biopsies because cancers were missed when it was a targeted only approach. Well to be honest I'm a little bit surprised because uh, I had the feeling and that at least the guideline group had the feeling that uh, once we clearly say systematic plus targeted in a pre-negative previous ne in the pre uh, first biopsy in the repeated biopsy we we quite clearly considered that targeted enough uh, targeted only might be enough mm -hmm. i'm quite surprised by the missed criteria the missed uh, significant cancer they had it might be related to mri quality it might be to mri technique i don't know mm -hmm. but I, I was a little bit surprised by the the results they mm. were presenting. 
And I think it's fair to say that there is a difference in the availability of MRI in Wales as opposed to England. When we looked at that in the National Prostate Cancer Audit, um, there was more than 80% availability of prostate MRI in England and roughly half of that in Wales. So I think there has been some differences in uptake across the two countries, even though we're all obviously together as the UK. Um, and I think that probably accounts for some of it. In, in my practice, I always want to know exactly what sort of biopsy they've had previously. So if they've had a sort of six core trust from 10 years ago, I'm going to do That's things great. very differently, you know, compared to a, a yeah. sort of huge thing. And actually, I should have said in my, in my introduction, I apologise that, of course, you are head of the Prostate Cancer EAU Guidelines Committee. And, and you know, that's why it's great to have you here uh, talking about all of this. If we move on to the next poster. looks at the best timed pathway. So just to put things into context, in NHS England, we have um, a faster diagnosis standard pathway, and that is asking us to diagnose men within 31 days of their GP referral. We've got a further target to get that down to 28 days. And that target comes with financial penalties. So if you miss your target, either of your first target of 31 days to diagnosis or your 62 days to treatment, then you can incur a £5,000 fine per patient. So that enabled us to uh, bring in MRI some years ago on the basis that we could avoid those fines. And this is uh, the group from Stepping Hill Hospital uh, comparing the pathway before and after introduction of this um, targets and they used a new pathway to try and achieve the target. So they had 92 men on the traditional pathway and 29 men on the best timed pathway. They did find a difference of, so it was 46.3 days versus 31.9 days, so just about hitting that target most of the time, but there were only 29 men in that second cohort. Very interestingly, and if I've read it correctly, they seem to have biopsied all the men in the best time pathway, where we, we would really expect MRI to be allowing you not to biopsy some men. And they had a 50% uh, negative biopsy rate compared to a 25% negative biopsy rate on their old pathway. So um, I don't know if you had some thoughts or comments on that, Nicola. Well, I was surprised by the difference in terms of negative positive bi rate of biopsy with the two pathways. But what impressed me that, very much is the speed of your pathway. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say in my hospital, uh, between the GP referral and the appointment is roughly four weeks. Between the referral to, 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 the, to the clinic and the biopsy, it's usually three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, sorry, to the MRI, it's between uh, four weeks to six weeks. And between the MRI and the biopsy, it's again four weeks. We are far, far, far away from your 40 days or 30 days, which is, which is super. It, it's, it might be a very good way to try to organize all the pathway in a better, in a better way. I'm not sure that uh, jumping from 43 days to uh, uh, 32 days is a major issue mm -hmm. outside the fine. But at least you need to be organized and to organize everything. And that just for that, that's good. Yeah, I agree. And actually we have uh, people who are employed to track the pathway and they'll be phoning patients, having weekly meetings with clinicians, working out where you can save a few days here and there. So it, it does result in, um, you know, people getting an answer more quickly, which is, yeah. you know, which does have its advantages. Because even though we think that, a diagnosis of low-grade prostate cancer isn't something that you need urgently for patients who are referred with this might be cancer they're keen to get answers as soon as they can so yeah, for sure. at least for the brain it's it's a good to know yeah yeah exactly just for that it's good to know yeah <laughs> that's impressive Okay, so this next uh, section is really about how to do the biopsy once you've made a decision that that's what you're going to do. And this includes some comparisons of transrectal and transperineal, some on the technique and some on the outcomes. So the first poster in this section 
is from uh, Mr. Sharma and looking at the Alp-Nagelvin technique. So this is from the Northern Ireland Urology Group, looking at doing a, an MRI targeted biopsy, but they're doing it under local anesthetic with a specially adapted chair that we see uh, in the photograph there using a coaxial needle. So you use one long spinal needle to put in local anesthetic, then a coaxial needle, and then they put the uh, biopsy needle through that. And they've got an impressive positive biopsy rate. So for their PIRADS4 lesions, 45 out of 50 of these were um, positive, of which eight were Gleason 6 and 37 were Gleason 3 plus 4 or ISUP2, giving them a 78% significant cancer rate for PIRADS4, which is very good. Um, and it looks like they've done a, a really good job of adopting that technique in, a, in an efficient and cost-effective manner without the need for software or general anaesthetic. Yeah, a, a, a general comment I have regarding this is uh, we are all discussing targeted, targeted, but we never check how targeted we target what is supposed to be targeted. Mm -hmm. That's the first point. They, they seem to be very effective. I would, I would be very interesting to know about their learning curve and their cure, the learning accuracy. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm more and more convinced that all the devices that are on the market, so far they haven't shown any benefit in terms of improving the accuracy. Mm -hmm. They might be absolutely of interest for the, the beginners. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you've done thousands of biopsies, you're supposed to have a little bit of geography in your mind and be able to know where you put your needle, at least where you want to put it. But when you begin, you don't, you're all, at least what, what I see with the resident, the fellows, uh, some of the biopsy are without any prosthetic tissue. So when you have that, targeting is just not possible. So yeah. what I, there's no evidence so far that any device improves the targeting compared to brain cognition, brain cognitive fusion it seems to be absolutely good in very expert hands. Yeah. No, I, and I agree. Uh, in our center, we tend to uh, use what, what we call a cognitive targeting. So we don't use software routinely. Um, we've been doing it for a long time, but and we have people come in and learn the technique, um, you know, on a regular basis as our fellows come through. Um, and quite often when I'm biopsying myself, I will simply, we do have grids available, but I'll take that off and just put the needle in through the skin without anything to kind of help. Because as you say, once you're used to the ultrasound image and where you kind of uh, can target it, it's, it's fairly straightforward. And I'm not sure that's as accurate as it should be if you perform only 100 or 200 biopsy a year. And I'm aware of many centers that are doing less than 100 biopsies per year. The question is, should, you, should, you, should they still keep going with the biopsy? That the question is different, but if you perform yeah. off, uh, there's no question. I, th I think in the UK, because we're organized into sort of cancer centers or not and, and diagnostic hospitals or not, there does tend to be a bit of concentration of the, of the expertise yeah. there. So it wouldn't be the case as it was 20 years ago that every urologist would do this. You'd need to be, have a, some sort of prostate cancer hat on to do it. Yeah, that makes sense, no question. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So the next poster is comparing transrectal and transperineal prostate biopsies from the National Prostate Cancer Audit. So this is um, national um, audit um, and I think they'll be looking at results from England in, in this poster and the idea of this was that all diagnosed men would be included in the audit. Much of the data is collected not from clinicians or from patients but from uh, hospital administrative data and in this poster they looked at men who were biopsied between 2014 and 2017 they correlated the audit data with hospital, um, hospital episode statistics data so that they could correlate the 
sort of um, consequences of having either a transrectal biopsy or a, um, a transperineal biopsy. And they looked at the differences in readmissions for sepsis, retention, and hematuria. And essentially, overnight stay was more likely with the transperineal biopsy due to retention and more likely overall, but it tended to be a shorter stay. If you're admitted after a transrectal biopsy, that was more likely to be due to sepsis and that tended to be a longer stay than otherwise. So quite interesting um, data there from a large national cohort. I fully agree that an absolute argument to switch to transperineal and to avoid transrectal, probably mm -hmm. the most important line on the table is mortality mm -hmm. from one from 0.1 to 0.07, which is attractive. It's, the p-value is not significant, but at least you have less, less death, which is good. I can tell you then in 2021, EAU guidelines, standard of care will be transperineal and no longer transrectal. So you're ahead of EAU for that. Brilliant. And that's, uh, that's always good to hear that what we do will be in, in due course approved um, at the EAU guidelines level. Based on a formal systematic review that the infectious panel have done. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm quite surprised by the rate of retention. Do you have the same, the same experience in your hospital? No, not at all. And I think there's a problem with grouping all transperineal biopsies together. So for a while, some people were doing five millimeter mapping very dense oh. biopsy, high retention rate. Whereas oh. I think if you do um, targeted biopsies, our retention rate is, tends to be less than 1%. Yeah. And that's because we do a targeted biopsy with some systematic rather than a, a huge sample. Yeah, exactly. If you do a whole prostate biopsy with 40 cores, that's not a surprise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I will move on to the next poster, which has a very similar theme. And this was looking at standalone HES data, so hospital episode statistics data. This is from the Lister Hospital and Guy's Hospital. And they looked back at a decade's worth of biopsies. So again, compared transrectal to transperineal, found that the sepsis rates were higher with a transrectal biopsy, as we would expect. Interestingly, in the last two years, the, the sepsis rates were 1.12% for transrectal versus 0.53% overall, suggesting that there's perhaps a problem with antibiotic resistance or some change there that's, that, that's made a difference. Readmissions were uh, more common for infection after a transrectal biopsy for retention after a transperineal. And they did some interesting calculations and uh, essentially proposed that you could save um, seven million pounds over a decade by, by converting to transperineal. And if you then converted to local anesthetic transperineal, as many people are doing now, especially yeah. with COVID, perhaps you could save 60 million over 10 years. So interesting analysis from similar, but not quite the same data. Yeah, that again, going in the same direction. The question for you, are you using uh, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis when you're doing a transperineal? Because there are data coming up suggesting that even this might be avoided. That is, that is a really good question. So in our hospital, we give them um, antibiotics at the time of the procedure, but they don't go home with any antibiotics. There, is, there are a couple of small randomized studies suggesting that there's not much difference. I think one was presented at, at our British conference last year. We have toyed with the idea of going completely antibiotic free. I think there's some groups in Japan that have also reported good rates, but we haven't quite taken that step yet. Okay. Well, there are data going in that direction. Even randomized trials suggesting that just skin prep might be enough. Mm. Yeah, and I think that would be interesting. And I think it would also be interesting to see whether there was a difference in sepsis between those who were having repeat biopsies or have had previous treatment, that kind of thing. But um, I guess uh, time and further studies will, will, will tell. Agree. But clearly, transparent is the way to go in the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we have ample evidence for that. 
So we now move on to what to do once you've finally diagnosed your prostate cancer. And the next poster in the session is from the University of Central Lancashire. And this was a, a, a report looking at men of South Asian origin versus men of Caucasian origin in the South Lancashire area. So I think it's fair to say that uh, there would be a lower community population of South Asian men in, in Lancashire than there would be, say, in London or in one of the big cities in the UK. And they found that 113 men in South Lancashire had been diagnosed over the last 10 years, showing that, um, you know, that is fairly small numbers. They found that they were more likely to be diagnosed with lower grade disease and with a lower PSA, more likely to have monitoring less likely to have radical surgery and they identified in particular some communication issues um, and have sort of said that they would look at identifying further potential barriers to accessing healthcare in this community. I don't know if there's much in France looking at the different um, ethnic populations and prostate cancer. Well in France it's very simple, ethnic does not exist. It's completely forbidden so it does not exist. Wow. Very simple, completely crazy, but that's how it goes. Ah. Uh, the question I had for that is, okay, the, the men are from, uh, from South Asian origin, but they, they live in UK for how long? How many generations? Mm. Uh, they get married with UK, uh, with UK natives. Mm -hmm. And are we dealing this with first generation, second generation, third generation? Does it change things? We know it. We know from other trials it changed things from Japanese moving to U.S. But at least it's of interest. The communication is an issue, which is not such a surprise. Yeah, and I presume there's a fair amount of these were first generation, um, in that just simply that uh, uh, over a third of them used an interpreter. So I presume um, that that uh, there were a significant number who were first generation. And I think it's common also, and we see it, that it's often family members that act as the interpreters, younger family members. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not the sort of thing that you want to be discussing with your school age child, no. but that does happen. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There is often, um, uh, there should be in, in the UK dedicated interpreter services, sometimes they can be by telephone, but they're not always as well used as they might be, so it's, uh, it can be a problem. Yeah. So if we move on to our next poster, this looks at the Cambridge Prognostic Group Score. So I'm actually going to see if I can tab on. So just looking at the table here, I thought it might be helpful to set out what the Cambridge Prognostic Group score is. And it really takes our three layered system of low, intermediate and high risk that we commonly use in sort of grouping things and puts it into a five tiered system. So the group one, Gleason, grade group one, PSA less than 10 stages, T1 to T2. Group two, really divides our usual intermediate risk into two separate groups. Slightly complicated because you can either be, you can be in group two if you're three plus four, grade group two, or an intermediate PSA of 10 to 20 and stage T1 to T2. And then group three also includes three plus four, PSA 10 to 20 and stage T1 to T2, or a Gleason, uh, four plus three grade group three and stage T1 to T2. So really just a, a way of dividing up the uh, different groups that we can put people into after diagnosis. And I think, great. So now we're back to the, the poster itself. And this is another poster from the National Prostate Cancer Audit Team. So they applied this Cambridge prognostic grouping to men diagnosed in the audit and they looked at the radical treatment rates according to the different groups. Not surprisingly they've seen that there is uh, an increased likelihood of radical treatment as you go up those groups. They've also seen that 
there were quite a lot of hospital differences in the Cambridge Prognostic Group 2, suggesting that there may be some variations there that might need to be looked at more carefully. Are men in this group, are some of them being undertreated um, or indeed overtreated? And perhaps we should look at these things more carefully. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always nice to have something that is more detailed than just the low, intermediate and high risk. Mm -hmm. And once again, I tell you, EAU will modify a little bit this classification. Uh, what, which is not such a surprise uh, is that uh, there is a tendency to have more radiotherapy with the more with the highest group. Mm -hmm. That's not such a surprise. What um, uh, I would be very interesting to see, we would have exactly the same trend outside UK. Mm. Not so sure. I think I think that would be interesting. And my um, slight criticism of this group is that they don't take into account the MRI findings. Yes. So I think when we look at the three-tiered system, I think there's very few people who would treat all intermediate risk disease the same. Of course, one millimeter of three plus four is very different to 15 millimeters of four plus three. And I think we're used to that in our daily decision-making. So it was a somewhat artificial thing anyway. It would be very helpful to look at this in the MRI era because the uh, classification was actually the original grouping wasn't based on uh, men who uh, typically had an MRI. So, but it'll be interesting to see what happens to this this score in the future. That's correct. It's well, it it would be of interest to see also the the explanation why uh, grey group one and grey group two many of them were did not receive any form of active treatment. Mm -hmm. But that's at least. When you subdivide the intermediate risk group, which is the one that needs to be stratified, you get more detailed results, which is good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think it'll be certainly interesting to watch how this is used in the future. Yeah. So and moving the outcome on. of all this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because in fact, what we really want to know is how successful is treatment in these in these groups. Exactly. And, and yeah, we're a little way off that yet. So moving on to our last poster, uh, this is looking at predicting pathological results at radical prostatectomy from initially just the MRI scan preoperatively and then trying to add in the PSA density. So this was a series of over a thousand uh, in fact, 1,421 radical prostatectomies between Eastbourne and Kent and Canterbury hospitals. The MRI that they had was the hospital standard of 1.5 or 3 Tesla, and they assessed MRI and PSA density. And when they used the MRI findings and a PSA density, which set at a pretty high threshold of 0.25, they found that gave them a positive predictive value of 84% for extra catchable extension. Concordance for T3A alone between the MRI and the PATH, 62%, 58% for T3B, uh, interpathological PT3B. So I think really what they're recommending is adding in the using MRI, but not relying totally on the MRI, adding in PSA density as well. I don't know how you do this in, uh, in, in France. Yeah, we, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're just not just relying on MRI. What surprises me on this poster is the table in the bottom, in the bottom left, with uh, 400 T3 and MRI leading to 100 PT2. That suggests when one, of, one out of four were overstaged by MRI. And I'm quite surprised because I thought but I had the feeling that the, when the MRI tells you it's a T3, mm -hmm. it's often correct, while the opposite is of, might be completely wrong. Mm. And I think, I mean, we're always interested in, um, I suppose we'd term it radiological T3A. So indirect signs of involvement yeah. that we know you wouldn't detect on a digital rectal examination. So in fact, our radiologists will often report, you know, signs of early radiological T3A does not preclude radical treatment, et cetera, to sort of recognize that. And I think it would be 
interesting to see if at some point we do more finely calibrate things because all of our previous predictive tables were based on clinical examination for T3. And we all know that radiological T3A is quite a different, um, quite a different thing really. Correct. What is also missing in this is the size. What yeah. about the size? Because if you know that there's a chance to be PT3 and does it change the way you operate? If you, if, if you believe it changed, then you need to know on which size. Either the left or the right or both. But yeah, I, I agree completely. And I think when we look back at the whole poster session, I'm really heartened to see some really good large series, both surgically and diagnostically, from various groups around the country. And I think it's really helpful having the interrogation of the national databases, so the National Prostate Cancer Audit, the HES data. And uh, both of those things are things I'm often particularly proud of the UK for when we're you know, taking this work uh, internationally. Yeah, you need to be absolutely proud of that. Mm -hmm. Because you push forward the MRI and you were right. You have the stampede results. Nobody will argue <laughs> with the stampede results, even if some discussion might occur. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were far ahead of us regarding the approach in terms of biopsy. You're, you're correct. You're mm -hmm. absolutely proud. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say so. And to all those young urologists out there who are considering going into research, I think there's huge opportunities in the UK for that that simply aren't available everywhere in the world. So if you've got the chance to take part in some research, I would really encourage you to do that, whether that's as a full-time research fellow for a while or taking part in one of the big studies that are being done and particularly those set up by the Trainee Collaborative. I would like to finish by thanking you very much, um, Professor Mose, for joining us. In a, well, it's, it's a rainy evening here in the UK in these difficult times when really we would have all hoped to be going out for dinner after this sort of session, but of course that won't be the case. And to say that, like everybody, I really hope that at some point in the future we will get back to our physical meetings and our international collaboration that we're uh, so keen to have. But thank you very much for your time this evening. It was my pleasure. Thank you.